Hey, welcome back to my helicopter project. The goal of this project is to create a realistic 3D model of a helicopter. One that I can use for future videos about helicopter aerodynamics and control. Today's video will be a progress update and also a response to viewer comments and questions. In the last video, I had completed the rotating and non-rotating swashplate motions as they would move in response to pilot control inputs but I hadn't yet connected the swash plates to the rotors. As of today's videos, I've added the pitch control rods and the blade lead lag dampers, and I completed the motions of the swash plates as they connect to the pitch control rods. Also completed the motions of the rotating scissors and the blade dampers. I haven't made any progress on the tail rotor. That's the same as it was on the last video. I'm now showing the motions of the swash plates, the pitch control rods, and the rotating scissors. The kinematics of these things has been by far the most challenging aspect of this build. To start, I'll take you through all of the control inputs first, both with the rotor stopped and then with the rotors turning, and then I'll show how the controls are rigged. I'll start with collective input. This changes the pitch of all the blades at once. This is lateral cyclic input. This changes the pitch of the blades once per cycle of revolution, hence the name cyclic, and allows the helicopter to turn left and right. I know some of you expect the swash plate to tilt purely forward and aft for lateral motion. It doesn't because of a concept called swash plate advance angle. And we'll go over that right after I show all of the control inputs and responses. This is longitudinal cyclic input. This allows the pilot to pitch the nose attitude of the aircraft up or down. And now here are those inputs again, but with the rotors turning. Here's collective, lateral cyclic and longitudinal cyclic. Now let's go into the rigging of the flight controls and also introduce this concept of the swashplate advance angle. To illustrate that, we'll talk about the aircraft in a left-hand turn. Helicopter pilots know that when we want to turn left in a machine with counterclockwise rotor rotation, we need to increase the pitch angle of the blades as they pass the six o'clock position of the aircraft. We input the desired blade control 90 degrees before we want it to affect the helicopter. And for the purists out there, it's a little bit less than 90 in aircraft that have hinge offset. The Blackhawk does have hinge offset, so um, I said 90 degrees, maybe 87, 88, something like that. Of course, pilots don't need to think about this while they're flying. This phase shift is designed into the control rigging. When you want the aircraft to go left, you push the stick left, and the flight control system takes care of the control phase delay. In the animation, I'm now moving the cyclic stick to the left and the six o'clock blade increases feathering or pitch. This is what we want the rotor to do for a left-hand turn. To understand how the swash plate moves to increase pitch on that six o'clock blade, let's look at where the input comes from. Looking down from above, we can visually line up the pitch change horn with the swash plate. This point is where we want the lateral cyclic to influence the swash plate. And this is also why swashplate motion seems counterintuitive. I'll draw a line from the center of rotation to the pitch change horn and then project the line downward to the swashplate. This is where we need to move the swashplate to affect lateral rotor control. In other words, to affect this aft blade, we don't want to move the swashplate here at the location of the aft blade. We want to move it here at the location of the pitch control rod. And the angular difference between these two points is called the swashplate advance angle, and for this design, it works out to 30.7 degrees. So the swashplate has to tilt on an axis that's 30.7 degrees skewed from the aircraft's principal axis system in order to control the aircraft in the way that we expect. Now let's look at modeling the motion of the pitch change horns and the pitch control rods. The geometry you see on the screen is a collection of what the Blender people call empties. These are objects that don't have mesh data and they don't render on the screen, but they can be used to control the motion of other objects. To control the blades, I'm interested in two of these empties. I'm interested in the vertical travel of the lower end of the pitch control rod and the rotation axis of the pitch change horn. This bottom empty is parented to the rotating swash plate so no matter how I move or tilt the rotating swash plate, this empty moves along with it. It stays locked into these bolt holes, much like the actual bolts for the lower end of the pitch control rod would stay locked into position in the real world. 
So we're interested in the z-axis height of this empty, but we don't care how that height changed. It can change through a collective input or a cyclic input, and regardless of how it changes, we want to use the vertical position of this to drive the rotation of the pitch change horn. In this view, you see the rotation of the pitch change horn. If I ignore vertical pitch link motion caused by flapping and lead lag, then I can simplify this motion to a two-dimensional problem. I, I think this is an okay simplification for an animation. Um, the axis of rotation of those degrees of freedom is the same axis as the pitch change horn rotation. The error is small. But with this as a two-dimensional triangle, and remembering back to high school, the tangent of the feathering angle is equal to the opposite side of this triangle divided by the adjacent side. The opposite side is the vertical motion of the pitch control rod that I just talked about, and the adjacent side of the triangle is the distance the upper pitch change horn is from its center of rotation. This distance is a constant, and I measured it in the computer-aided design. And then to further simplify, the angles are small, so it's good enough to apply the small angle approximation and just say that blade angle is equal to the vertical motion of the pitch control rod divided by the pitch change horn offset distance. And to make that happen in the animation, here is the driver, editor, and blender, and this shows how the single input variable can drive the feathering motion of the blade. The input variable is the lower end of the pitch control rod, and it drives the X rotation of the blade with the equation in the expression field. The expression has a couple of constants in it to shift the local coordinates, but otherwise it's the same, and it's just as simple as what's on the screen. The simplification that I talked about before, ignoring the vertical motion of flapping and lead lag, those introduce some error. If I zoom in on the end of the pitch control rod, you may be able to see this error. These things should not be sliding in relation to one another. I measured this total error, and it's about 6 millimeters out of a total of 100 millimeters of travel. I'm pretty happy with that level of error because it made the math so simple. For those of you interested in another animation technique, while I used a driver and math to control the motion of the pitch change horn, I didn't use a driver for the pitch control rods themselves. Instead, I placed an armature on the pitch change horn and the swash plate at locations where the pitch control rod connects, and then I used a damped track constraint to point each end of the armature to the connection point of the opposite rod ends. Then I parented the pitch control rods to those armatures so they follow their motion. This technique of using an armature with a damped track constraint is the same technique I use for modeling the motion of the lead lag dampers. So that's it for my update on the build progress as of today. My next goal is to get the tail rotor complete. I haven't mentioned or discussed the stationary flight controls. Everything that you see here is only the rotating flight controls. Um, there's a whole other set of pitch links and bell cranks and hydraulic actuators that are below the stationary swash plate. And I, I may or may not get to that soon. I think I may shift towards doing some of the um, kind of the educational videos before I go back and animate those things into the system. And for those of you that watched the first video in this playlist, I want to remind everybody that the reason I'm doing this as an incremental build is so that I can use viewer comments to make this into a better project. Um, I really do appreciate the comments that are coming in. It's telling me where I've got inaccuracies and errors in this design and also where I'm saying some things that are incorrect. And I need to go on the record and correct one of those things right now. In the last video, I called this rotor hub a semi-rigid rotor. This is incorrect, and apparently I've been incorrect on this for the last 30 years. Terminology is important. It's necessary to allow communities of interest to share knowledge. Um, but what I've found in the last few days is that there's enough inconsistencies in the definition of types of rotor hubs that I'm not any longer sure what to call this kind of a rotor. Other than I'm positive it's not a semi-rigid rotor. It has elements of a fully articulated rotor. It also has elements of a rigid rotor. And I found a couple of different sources that define those things differently. And this does or does not fit into, uh, into all those different sources. I'm definitely curious to hear your comments and how you would define the Sikorsky Blackhawk Rotor Hub. Uh, but I will point out that the Blackhawk Flight Manual doesn't say what type of rotor hub this is. Instead, they just describe it. Um, which is maybe a better way of doing it. It, it removes the ambiguity. Um, what they say is that each blade flaps, feathers, and lead lags independently. 
All three axes, flapping, feathering, and lead lag, rotate at the same point on the blade. And, and just an interesting thing, this is different from other fully articulated rotors, ones that have mechanical bearings for all the degrees of freedom. And the three rotor degrees of freedom use a combination of elastomeric bearings and mechanical bearings. The hub uses elastomeric bearings for flapping in lead lag and a mechanical bearing for blade feathering. One commenter asked why trim tabs are used during rotor track and balance and not pitch adjustments, and this made me realize that I only gave an incomplete description in the video. The answer is that mechanics adjust three things during a rotor track and balance. They adjust the pitch control rods, the trim tabs, and blade tip weights. There were a couple of comments about how a video game version of this, where a student pilot or a student mechanic could move the controls and see the responses to the rotor system. Um, I absolutely agree. That would be awesome. I, I don't know how to do it. As of right now, I have custom properties as sliders in Blender. And I can use these to change the control positions, but the subsequent response to flapping and lead lag isn't modeled. Those are independent properties that I can drag around. Um, it would definitely be cool to feed in the equations of motion for a flying helicopter so the control motions result in realistic aircraft response. And there was one comment too that I'm kind of drifting around onto many different topics at once. And this was a really good comment, but please remember the purpose of this series was focused on the build of the 3D model. And I'm kind of just, as I'm building it, I'm drifting around to different topics on aerodynamics and control. I'm more focused on the build than I am on having a coherent explanation of how these concepts work. Once the model is complete, I plan to shift to what is more hopefully a well thought out and more coherent instructional series on helicopters. But thanks for the comments and thanks for keeping them coming. I've been around large helicopters for most of my life and I think I know a fair amount about this topic, but every time I post a video, I find out how little I know. Um, if there's anything that I show that's not correct, I'd love to hear about it. I can learn from that. Um, the audience that watches this content can learn from that and we can all become smarter about how these amazing machines work. Thanks for the interest. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next video.